to uh, <clears throat> give you a rundown on the publicans who have entertained and given hospitality at the Shamrock Hotel over the century. There'll always be a Shamrock spreading joy and glee. If Dunstown means as much to you as Dunstown means to me. <laughs> as you know, the Shamrock is settled between two lovely mountains, the uh, Warren Heap and uh, Bunanyong, and our theme has been Men Will Meet Where Mountains Won't at the Shamrock Hotel Dunstown. And so on with the list of uh, hoteliers who have been over the years, starting off with the first licensee, Elizabeth Miles. And there are miles after those, because uh, there are 17 or 18 in all. Then there was, after Elizabeth Miles, there was Theo W. Redmond, Thomas Coogan, Lawrence Flynn, James Patrick Kane, Mary Ann Kane. Am I going too fast? And after that, the Canes came Austin Neville. Now, Austin Neville was here for just on 30 years, about a third of the time that the Shamrock has existed. They were a wonderful family. Austin Neville sold out to Anthony William O'Halloran on behalf of himself and Maureen Therese O'Halloran and they were wonderful publicans. They sold out to John Joseph Britt. Now, John Joseph Britt was a wonderful historian, a person who could relate stories of great interest. The Burke family came in after John Joseph Britt, and our association with the Shamrock Hotel has been similar to the uh, existence of um, Austin Neville and them. we've been here for 30 years, nearly a third of the time that we're speaking of. Following Barbara Burke came Leslie Keith Gillett and Eileen Gillett. They sold out to Yellen Proprietary Limited. The nominee was Ross Stanley George. After Ross Stanley George came Dunstown Hotel Proprietary Limited in the form of Kevin Dowsley. For a short time after Kevin, there was the Dalton Falls Proprietary Limited, then Shane, Stephen Shane Begby took over. Stephen Shane Begby and Janet K. Begby. And the Begby name is renowned throughout the district for its prowess in sport and its great contribution to the district. And last but not least, we have today Helen J. Pockinghorn, a dear lady who came here for one year, and that's multiplied by seven. The dear lady has enhanced herself to everyone in the community and has added a great deal of interest, hospitality and warmth to the Shamrock Hotel. I would like to say over the hundred years that uh, all of these publicans, 17 or 18 in number, have uh, given hospitality, warmth and joy and made the Shamrock Hotel a great meeting place for the district people. i conclude by reminding that men will meet where mountains won't, and women too, <laughs> at the Shamrock Hotel Dunstown, and I hope it continues for another hundred years, <laughs> although we mightn't be here to see it. Well, we all know what tonight is, don't we? A hundred years old the hotel is, and there's a great centenary. And I'd really like to thank the committee and all the people that helped me decorate the hotel. 
I'm not so rolling my family, but helping and working for nothing tonight. <laughs> and also for every one of you attending here, and I really hope that you have a wonderful time and you enjoy your night. And um, we're looking forward for you to come back. So all I hope that the Shamrock keeps on going, and the only way it will be if we all come back and visit it. I love it here, it's a uh, home for me. Um, I've come for six months and it's nearly seven years. So thank everybody for everything that they put in and everything that they have done. And also thank you, the community for welcoming me to Dunstown. Thank you. Now as a special, um, special treat tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have a few the local identities up singing tonight to help celebrate this uh, great celebration. And first, first up tonight is a young fella, he's only 10 year old. His name's Lachlan Murphy. Give Lachlan a big round of applause. Please give us your uh, attention and your ears. We young Lachlan, thank you. Fifteen, went to school across the road. Yeah, rode a, a pony to school most days of the week. And, and I had a few drinks here when I was fifteen with Arthur Murphy. Uh, one one night here, I uh, rode a horse in the bar, and uh, Jack Britt was the licensee at the time, and he said, "Get that damn horse out of here." It didn't take very kindly to it at all. Another night here, uh, John Burke was a licensee and we had a bit of a disagreement. And he was going to throw me out, so I said, there'll be no doing that, John, I'll throw you out instead, so just open the door and throw him out. Uh, it was a Friday night here uh, years ago, there'd be uh, 25, 30 drinkers here. But now in so five and all the old blokes are dying and it's gradually drifting away. But, but hopefully we can keep it going. By the year we won the tug of war was a, a memorable occasion. It was 63 and 64 at the Royal Show on Channel 7. And we went down as the underdog. We went through undefeated on two years in a row. Where is the old tug of war team? For once was crowned with glory. Six fighting men of Dunstown, part to their sad story. There was Walsh and Mara in Wilshire, and also Murphy Street, Ray Don and Leo, and strong as men could be. Wiltshire was the anchor man, weighed 18 stone more, the muscles of his brawny arms 
the lights were seen before. The bus was Murphy Senior. I pleased the one I mean. He trained these boys to perfection. None could beat this team. In 1962 and 3, that's when they showed their zip. On Royal Show and TV, they won the championship. The boss would roar a ginger. They pulled like men possessed. No could stand their powers. They always came up best. But now this team is quite defunct. As dead as dead could be. We'll do the only decent thing. Send flowers. All right, King. position up the road in those days was the Olive Branch and uh, I think they sent a message to Melbourne that there was trading after church and uh, they raided the, the gaming uh, squad came from Melbourne and raided the church on Sunday one caught everybody in the in the pub except one old gentleman old John Howard who was about 90 at the time I think he just casually sat at the bar, went along and every full glass of beer he knocked off and then when he went to walk out of the room, uh, a policeman at the door said, uh, hey, what about you? I haven't got your name. He said, oh, the fellow over there has got it. Uh, he took it, so he waltzed out and he was the only one out of the whole lot in the pub that wasn't caught and fined. He got all the free beer along the bar and, and walked out scot-free. Yeah, well, my story is that my father and I come here one Sunday morning after Mass. The same thing, you know, the, I think Jack Britt was the, in the licensee or owner at the time. And uh, anyway, there used to be a, co a good watch kept on what they call Ballarat Road. And there's a strange car come down the Ballarat Road. We all have to take very careful uh, note of it. Anyway, this particular day it looked a bit more ominous than the rest, so he said, you better get out. So we all went over the back fence, down the paddock, around by the hall, the old hall that got burnt down, and back to my place, over the back fence into my backyard. 
and Rosalie, my mother, in the kitchen wondering what the hell was going on because we were coming in from that direction and not down the road. But anyway, that, the coppers never turned up as it turned out. But uh, they, we thought they were on the, on the job like Brian just said then. Hi, I'm Helen. Helen Brish, now Millman, uh, for those people that don't know me. Uh, I came out here about 39 years ago, 40 years ago now. Uh, married Bob Brish. Um, we had a beautiful family out here and I made wonderful friends. It was about six years I'd been married before I came into the hotel because I was led to believe that women did not go to hotels um, unless they were women of ill repute. <laughs> and I wasn't, so I didn't go. But my dear friend Kat came in here one day and brought me in and I never stopped going after that. Friday nights, Saturdays maybe, but great memories of this place. Um, the night Vanderport one, I'll never forget it. The walls were busting like tonight. They came from Bunbury and everywhere and it was great. And great publicans over the time, Eileen Keith, Sue and Ross George. Um, now we've just had great times and it's just lovely to be back here. I've moved on, um, but the memories here will never be forgotten. So thank you. I would come in the shamrock one Saturday lunchtime, myself and my old mate Bernard, and Sharky Britt was the publican at the time, and he, he walked over and he said to Jimmy Richardson, I, I have a problem with my tomcat. And Jimmy said to him, if you've got a sharp razor blade, Sharky, I'll fix this tomcat. He looked down the bar and he said to Bernard, he said, um, have you got a rubber boot? He said, yeah, I've got a rubber boot. He said, he went over to the house just over the road and brought back the rubber boot, rock got the cat, shoved it into the rubber boot, snip, snip with the razor weight. He pulled him out with his teeth. Bernard, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Blood everywhere. And he turned around and he said to Bernard, open the door, Bricky. The cat went out the door. Well, I'm not sure we've seen the cat since. <laughs> Hello, I'm, uh, my name's Tim Poynton, I'm, uh, I'm the grandfather, of, the grandson of, uh, of Austin and Margaret Neville. Um, I've been coming up here since, uh, since I was a kid. My aunt Maureen, Maureen Keeley owns a farm uh, just up the road um, and uh, my grandparents actually owned this pub from 1925 to uh, 1958. So there's a long history of uh, family tradition and uh, family history uh, with, with Dunstown. Um, and as a kid, um, I used to come up here uh, on school holidays and uh, for many years until, uh, until I was probably uh, finishing school. Uh, I've had some very fond memories of the place and been coming up back here um, um, ever since. Uh, one, of the, one of the real uh, fond memories I have of uh, is uh, coming uh, to the pub uh, with my uncle of a Saturday night and um, we'd be uh, sitting around the bar drinking and uh, back in those days the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, situation of the day was that the farmers used to always wear their hats on the back of their heads and um, they'd be sitting at the bar drinking a few pots and after a few pots they'd be, they'd be very happy and the the hats would go further back on their heads and uh, a few more pots and a few more pots and uh, there's a chap by the name of Johnny Walsh who's obviously uh, um, a bit of a cult hero in the town. He'd, uh, he'd love the, the hats on the back of the heads of the uh, farmers and he used to uh, take to the hats and fling them across the bar. And so as a kid all I remember is, um, is the situation of these hats flying across to and from the bar. I don't know if that's changed ever since, so I guess the, the hats have probably uh, altered a bit and uh, so yeah, so that's one of my one of my real fond memories. I guess at a time like this when we're celebrating the occasion of a hundred years of existence of the church at Dunstown and the Shamrock Hotel. The point that I, one of the points I'd like to make is the uh, significance of the affinity between the church and the hotel itself. And that is, for example, that uh, uh, normally the Sunday morning mass that always be the Catholic hour after after mass, and my journey over here to the hotel 
so there was a tie up there and uh, in some ways the church was good for the hotel and supporting it. On the other hand, uh, there were so many good times within the hotel itself and uh, people enjoying themselves in a nice and even way, a uh, fair bit of singing and that type of thing. And uh, I guess uh, in relationship to the church, that too was good for the soul. As far as this hotel is concerned, it's been uh, fairly unique, I guess, in some ways, because it survived the time. Uh, it is of note that there's two hotels in this area, the Olive Branch up the road, and, and this place, I'm not sure when the Olive Branch opened, but it closed around about 1957, I think. But this township was able to support two hotels and do it fairly well. But of course, we have to remember too that uh, times were different then because there was so much labour employed on farms. Uh, we had the distillery which was a very vibrant business and it, uh, it employed people right around the clock for 24 hours. And uh, I think more than anything is the Irish background that has really stuck to a place like the Shamrock Hotel. Um, there are some areas, I guess, that haven't quite survived the time uh, because of mixtures of cultures. And, uh, but the Irish seem to always, for one reason or another, be able to, uh, to help a hotel to survive. <laughs> Well, that's a good trait or not, I'm not too sure. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a man with many talents. And believe it or not, he might have a bit to do with horses, but he can also sing a song. Put your hands together for David Murphy. <laughs> made a difference definitely uh, business wise and I suppose one of the differences in the pub game over the years was when we first came here the likes of old boss Murphy, mm -hmm. Kevin Lanigan, Eddie Clark they'd come down for a drink at lunchtime uh, naturally Chris Hardigan, Coco, Coco can drink about enough for four and uh, Ray and Don always dropped in for one or two on the way home for lunch. And then by the time we left, there was none of those fellas, and still only Ray and Don, which just fell apart. It wasn't worth eight years or uh, Couldn't come back and do it again too old. <laughs> uh, Mr. B and, and the people, the people in this town, although we still see a lot of the people from Dunstown. Uh, many funny New Year's Eves. Usually end up out around the roundabout at six o'clock in the morning. People run around the roundabout. <laughs> Many nights I didn't see the bed. I don't, must admit. <laughs> uh, I think the things we miss just looking around tonight are some faces that are not here with us anymore. Not mentioning any names, but yeah, some, some good times and some sad times. And There's another story that I'm going to delve into. Keith and I were in the pub. Had a new water bed. And Ray and I drinking together, Ray Murphy. Isles out there and Isles said to Ray, do you want to come and have a look at it? This is about up past nine, ten o'clock at night. So Ray comes in and he hops on, he's lying on the water bed. And I was lying beside him. So I knew Ray was missing, I'd brought a round of drinks. And I said to, I don't know who was behind the bar, but I said, give me a towel and a tray 
and a couple of glasses. Room service? So I go into the bedroom, room service with the grog in the tray and the towel. And that's all right. Take it into Ray and uh, Isle. Next bloody minute, Keith follows me in. What the bloody hell is going on in here? <laughs> so Ray, Ray got out pretty quick. Yeah. There's some of the funny stories. Nothing in it, just great times. There's another one was when my uncle had the hotel here, the Shamrock, and it was six o'clock closing, and uh, we were only juniors, about 17 or so, and we called in here one Sunday to, to get a beer. And I rapped on the side door there, and my uncle come to the door, <coughs> and he said, who is it? I said, your nephew, Conrad. His answer was, Go home to your mother, you'll get no beer here. <laughs> you know, just look around, there's a lot of memories here. Uh, a lot of people could tell more than what I could, but, uh, you know, I, I spent 10 years out of the town, and when you come back, you really do appreciate it. I see all uh, the blokes have lived here all their life, and there's a lot passed on who uh, were legends of the place, and uh, a very good spot to live, I think.